welcome to the Shopfront Youth Legal Centre service visit. If you have any questions during the presentation, please pop them in the, question, in the chat box and we'll come to them at the end of Jane's presentation. Um, may I now introduce Ben Carbless, Executive Community Family and Children's Services from Mission Australia. Hi, Ben. Morning, Greg, and thank you for that. And welcome, everybody. It's, it's great to um, have you join us once again online. Uh, and we're really looking forward to learning more about, well, sharing with you more about the Shopfront Youth Legal Centre from Jane Sanders, our, our leader in that area and principal solicitor. But before I do that, I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, the country on which I'm on, dark and young land here on the Central Coast, like many of you may be in lockdown, uh, and uh, want to recognise the land that we're on, the cultural heritage and elders past, present and future, for they do hold the memories, the culture and the dreams of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Recognise that it was NAIDOC week, there was a, last week there was a lot of activity that happened in Mission Australia, uh, and... Uh, some of it online, but some of it um, in different states, face-to-face uh, -face and really provided a lot of recognition, which was, which was great to see and we want to continue to do that. But we will be hearing more about the shop front soon. Uh, we've been delivering such an incredible service since 1993 and uh, I know Jane will be sharing and giving you much more insight in regards to that. But I do sit here in, in lockdown once again, I'm on the central coast, part of the greater Sydney area. Uh, and it's been challenging for many. Um, many of us have our family at home, but a lot of our young people are also have really struggled through this. Uh, and I want to let you know that in about three weeks' time, we're going to be launching our Young Voices of the Pandemic report. Uh, it's a sub-report of our youth survey. Uh, this one was taken uh, in 2020, uh, and we heard from the voices of our young people through the time of April to August last year right in the heart of when the, the pandemic was really starting to take hold. It was a time where young people were really feeling the hit of isolation, um, removal from peers, friends, much needed support. We heard about issues of people experiencing, young people experiencing some challenging mental health concerns arrange, amongst a range of other things. But I don't wanna to go too far into the findings of this report. It was a, it really, draws information from over 20,000 young people across the country. And we're going, to be, we're going to be launching that in about three weeks' time. But I've got a couple of insights. I'll read out uh, some of the voices from our young people from around the states. Um, just bear with me as I read this uh, with you. This is from a young female from Queensland who was 16 years old. Feeling isolated with a single working mother and not a lot of family and small school, it is easy to feel alone. Being stuck at home this year hasn't helped. Corona has made it feel like I'm helpless and everything that is dying, I, as a young person, have no control over. There's a male here now from Victoria. He's 17 years old. It's been pretty hard to stay motivated in schoolwork and life, in general, during the pandemic and quarantine. I would say that this is the biggest issue as it has a ripple effect on all the other parts of my life. A fe another female from New South Wales, she's 17. I feel like my anxiety has been the worst it has ever been this year. Being a year 12 student, as well as the effects of quarantine and losing time with my friends and being laid off in my job, I've experienced significant levels of stress. I just feel anxious all the time. And another female of 17 from New South Wales, I just need more support and reassurance that I won't be put at a loss because of COVID. So, so many stories um, of our young people, and we'll be hearing more about that uh, a bit later when we, release, when we launch that report in about three weeks' time. We did also hear incredible stories of such resilience from our young people, incredible uh, ability to respond and adjust and adapt to the environment. So there's some incredible stories as well uh, that we heard and we continue to be inspired by that. But this morning is all about learning more about the Shopfront, um, our youth legal centre that provides such incredible pointy support for our young people that uh, really need that level of support. So I'm going to get out of the way now and I'm going to hand over to uh, Jane Sanders, our principal solicitor, um, for the Shopfront uh, Youth Legal Centre. 
Welcome, Jane. Thank you, Ben. Can everybody hear me or have I accidentally got myself muted? You sound wonderful. That's great. Um, thank you, everybody, for um, dialing in wherever you are. Um, I would like to acknowledge today I'm on Gadigal land and I would also like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and importantly, of course, emerging. Um, also, you will see this painting in the background. I thought I might um, just have a quick word about that before I start. Um, this painting sits in our um, interview room at the shop front. It was made by a young Koori man who was a former client of our service. Um, he was a, in many ways a typical shopfront client, a young man from a very difficult background, had experienced homelessness, mental health problems, substance abuse issues. Um, he was involved in the criminal justice system, which is why he came to us. Um, he ultimately ended up um, doing amazing things, including um, going on to study um, youth work, getting a job with a local youth service. Um, one thing that sustained him through the really difficult times was um, art and he's as you can see I think even if you find the colours a little bit loud and confronting I think you would agree he was a really talented artist and um, we were so delighted when he gave us this painting and that's um that's been hanging on the wall for quite a few years now but let's um go on to the presentation and tell you a little bit more about our service I have got someone Dan uh, controlling the slides for me. So I'm really grateful for him doing that. I just thought I'd give you something to look at um, other than me. So you'll see um, down the bottom of that first slide, there are three logos. Um, obviously, you're all here today because of your connection with Mission Australia um, and because of Mission Australia's um, involvement with the shopfront but it's really important to acknowledge that the shopfront is a a partnership or it's a collaboration between um three different organizations um you'll you see all of those logos um down there and i'm going to talk a little bit about how that arose and um how how each of those parent organizations plays a role so maybe next slide can i have the next slide please dan thanks so who are we? Um, we're a free legal service for homeless and disadvantaged young people aged 25 and under, um, a joint project of those three organisations. Um, we were established in 1993, um, so 28 years now, which is incredible. Um, and we are based in Darlinghurst. We were set up um, all those years ago to be close to King's Cross, because that was really where um, where, well, where it was at in terms of um, youth homelessness, it was very much um, a, a centre um, or a mecca for homeless young people um, to come. There were lots of services in King's Cross. There still are, of course, including um, Mission Australia's King's Cross Youth Services, including The Crossing, who we work very closely with. Um, demographics have changed a lot over the years, though. The area is gentrified. Um, we still have a very solid base of inner city clients, but we also work with clients um, all over Greater Sydney. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so how it started, uh, those of you who are um, as old as I am might remember um, the Burdekin report in 1989. It certainly wasn't the first um, report or study that was done into youth homelessness, but it was the first one that really looked at it from a human rights point of view um, and measured, um, measured the experience of homeless young people against the um, standards in the international human rights uh, instruments that Australia has signed up to. Um, in particular, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which came into being um, at about the same time, I think it was ratified by Australia in 1989 or 1990. So as a result of that report, can we have the next slide? please. Um, the firm that is now Herbert Smith Freehills, it was then Freehill, Hollingdale and Page. Um, their Sydney office um, had a few um, 
very uh, dedicated um, partners um, who were very, very dedicated to pro bono work. The firm already had a very good pro bono program. And a few of those partners on the pro bono committee got together and decided that they wanted to do um, something to address um, issues arising from the Burdekin report, and particularly to fill a gap um, in services, um, legal services being provided to homeless young people. So um, some part that the partners from Herbert Smith Freehills um, initiated talks with what was then the Sydney City Mission, um, which of course um, became part of Mission Australia to set up a small shop front. And it was literally a shop front. It was around the corner from where we are now. It was in Darlinghurst Road. It was an old shop that it had been a secondhand bookshop. Before that, it was a pharmacy. Um, it's had various um, incarnations, that, that particular um, premises. Um, but it was yeah, literally just a one room shop with, with the plate glass windows. Um, Sydney City Mission had a lease on it thanks to some philanthropic um, assistance to pay the rent um, and conceived it originally as a youth information centre, um, but it ended up growing into a legal service um, thanks to the involvement of um, Freehills. Started with one lawyer, wasn't me, it was a lawyer um, called Ted Hill who was on secondment um, from Freehills at the time and one legal assistant called Jenny Taylor. Um, I joined it, well, not long after that. Um, I feel embarrassed when I talk about how long I've been at the shop front, actually. But um, I came to um, the shop front also from Freehills on what was supposed to be a secondment. They ended up creating a permanent um, position and the rest is history, as we say. Um, in 1997, the Salvation Army joined the partnership the building that we're now in is a three-storey terrace in Victoria Street. Um, it's owned by the Salvation Army. Um, the Salvos were able to buy this building thanks to a, a grant, a government grant um, some years ago. Um, we moved into this building. Uh, at that time, we were co-located with the Reconnect program. We have also been co-located at times with the um, Salvation Army SOS um, outreach service, which is now based at Oasis in Surrey Hills. Um, and the shop front now um, occupies the whole building. So that's how the partnership started. Um, we've also established other partnerships um, and we have other supporters. Um, and I really, really, really need to acknowledge them. Um, so although we've had the same three parent organizations over the years, we do partner up with um, other organisations and we receive support from them. So in 2010, we formed a partnership with the Public Interest Advocacy Centre, um, better known or also known as PIAC, um, to employ a social worker. Um, and that was on a pilot um, program. I think it was three years of pilot funding through the Law Society Public Purpose Fund. Um, we were able to employ a social worker called Jamie Alford. Um, Jamie is still a very, very good friend of the shop front, even though he's moved on from his job here. He's subsequently gone on to work at Legal Aid. He's now at High Street Youth Health Service. Um, and, and he's still a very uh, um, much valued friend and colleague of ours. After that pilot funding um, came to an end, we were able to make a case for um, a permanent um, social work or casework position. Mission Australia stepped in. So Mission Australia had always been um, a parent organisation of the shop front and had always contributed um, funding towards overheads, towards a car, phones, um, all those things um, that keep the shop front running other than just paying for staff. But Mission Australia um, stepped in and has taken since then has taken over the auspicing of the caseworker or social worker um, position and of course the funding of it. The funding, um, the majority of the funding for our current caseworker um, comes via the Matana Foundation. I'm not sure if anyone from the Matana Foundation is, is online today, but whether they are or not, I just have to extend huge thanks um, to them for their support. Now, another partnership um, 
that is of more recent origin and you won't probably find reference to it in this slideshow, we have another partnership um, which we've just entered into with the Public Interest Advocacy Centre, also um, with funding support from the Matana Foundation, and that's the um, Aboriginal Social Justice Graduate Program, which has enabled us to employ a law graduate um, who's just, just started with us. I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, if I have a little bit of time later on. But massive thanks to uh, partner organisations like PIAC um, and um, philanthropic organisations like the Matana Foundation for making this possible. We also have entered into partnerships with Legal Aid. Um, we have a partnership with their Children's uh, Civil Law Service, um, which provides expertise um, which we lack. Um, we also have more informal partnerships with um, Legal Aid. We receive grants of funding um, from them to get um, psychological and psychiatric assessments for our clients to brief barristers in cases which are too serious or complex for us to, to deal with ourselves um, and for, for similar sorts of purposes. So I have to also acknowledge um, that without Legal Aid New South Wales, uh, it would be very difficult for us to run our service. So even though we're a pro bono free service and we don't um, seek money from Legal Aid to cover our fees, um, certainly there are um, a lot of things that, that we do need their assistance with. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so our clients, um, we don't have any lower age limit for our clients. We sometimes get called upon actually to advise very young clients. I think the youngest has probably been about seven. Um, we occasionally get called in by the um, Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions to advise children who are being called as um, witnesses in criminal proceedings. Now, these children may be um, victims of crime themselves, but in many situations, they're actually witnesses to um, other people's alleged crimes. So typically domestic violence offences um, between their parents, for example. Sometimes these kids are, um, as you would imagine, really scared about giving evidence. They're nervous. They don't know what to expect. Sometimes these children also may have a right to um, object to giving evidence against a family member and they need somebody to explain to them um, what their rights are. So we've advised a lot of, the, so the children um, in that really younger end of the age group would tend to be um, victims of crime or witnesses. From the age of about 10 upwards, um, we are getting young people charged with criminal offences, um, as well as a whole variety of um, other types of legal issues. Um, our clients come from a really diverse range of cultural backgrounds. Consistently in our monthly stats, about 20% of our new matters um, involve clients who identify as um, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. However, they may describe their identity. They may identify as First Nations, uh, Wiradjuri, um, or, or, or in, in many ways. But uh, that's around 20% of our client base. Um, we also have a range of other um, cultural backgrounds represented among our clients. Um, every few years you will see perhaps a slight change um, in the composition of our client group depending on um, waves of perhaps recent arrivals um, from other countries. So um, recent years, more Sudanese um, young people, for example. Um, common to most of our clients though is that they are homeless. Um, Mostly that's due to abuse, neglect, um, family conflict um, or um, other issues which have caused young people to have to leave home or to be removed um, and taken into the care system. But increasingly um, over the last few years, probably the last 10 years, housing affordability, you'd have to be under a rock not to know what a huge issue that is. Um, and we're seeing an increasing number of young people who are homeless simply because they cannot afford to pay rent or because their family, it might be functional, it might be intact um, without any of those hideous problems that some of our clients experience. 
but we have generational homelessness now because people can't afford stable and secure housing. So that's, a, that's an increasing challenge. Next slide, please. Okay, um, I think I've probably addressed this. Um, most of our clients have complex needs um, due to homelessness for a start, but underlying that homelessness often is the experience of severe trauma. Um, many of our clients have serious mental health problems. Um, some also have cognitive impairments, such as an intellectual disability or an acquired brain injury. Um, and there are others with, um, or not others, they, 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 they do overlap. Um, most of our clients with a mental illness, um, many of them would also have a substance misuse problem as well. Uh, and it's very difficult to um, often untangle those problems. And it's certainly not a simple um, case of saying, um, oh, well, yes, you need to um, stop using drugs and everything will be okay. I think all of you um, would understand um, that it's more complex than that. And, and, and our clients' needs are perhaps more complex than most. Next, next slide, please. Okay. Um, most of our clients um, initially at least are referred to us by youth services. So we have really good relationships with a lot of local youth services, not just Mission Australia services, not just Salvation Army services, but a whole, a whole range um, of both government and non-government organisations. Um, we target those clients who are going to have difficulty accessing mainstream legal services, including legal aid, um, and who need really one-on-one -on -one intensive and holistic support. So um, we are very lucky to have um, legal aid, a legal aid system. We're very lucky we've got extremely competent lawyers who work for legal aid. I would also um, extend that to um, include the Aboriginal legal service as well. The sad fact is though, that those services are not adequately funded to meet um, the needs of their clients. Um, they have had to make quite severe cuts in um, the types of um, the number of courts they service in the case of the ALS, the types of matters they actually will act in um, in the case of legal aid um, and the time that they can spend with clients. Um, and, and as much as we wouldn't like it to be so, um, legal aid can still be um, something of a bureaucracy. Um, getting legal aid for a criminal matter um, is not always straightforward. And, and sometimes all of the forms and the financial um, verification um, that clients need to provide, sometimes that's a bit beyond our clients. Um, also clients with lots of different legal matters um, scattered around the place um, respond well to the kind of um, holistic support that we try to provide at the shop front. So that's the kind of clients that we're um, aiming to service. Um, I did say that initially most of them are referred by youth services, um, but some are also referred by um, friends and family and word of mouth. And then we have a lot of repeat clients. Some would say that's sad and certainly if it's for criminal matters and it indicates that people are still offending or still being charged with offences, or they're victims of crime and they're still experiencing domestic violence and sexual abuse or um, other forms of assaults. We hate it that they're having to come back to us, but we also love it that they trust us and that they will call us if they have got um, any kind of legal issue. Next slide, please. So these are our services. Um, we really focus a lot on criminal court representation on criminal charges and all of the advice that goes along with that. I think that was always, um, yeah, I, I think when the shop front was set up or certainly when I joined, that was always a primary focus because I think it was recognised that homeless young people are very much overrepresented when it comes to policing, when it comes to um, involvement in the criminal justice system, and they really do have special needs. So I think it was always part of the aim of the shop front um, that there would be a big focus on um, representing clients in criminal matters. But um, 
there also was, at least in the early days, I think more of a focus on family law and civil law type issues. I think over the years, um, I have to say, we have become uh, a bit de-skilled um, at some of those other legal issues. And so our main focus is representing um, young people who are either um, defendants in criminal matters or victims of crime. And of course, most of our clients are both. The idea that society is divided into two categories and we've got our innocent victims on the one hand and um, our offenders on the other hand, I think we all know that's not true. So um, we have a lot of clients who we are assisting in their capacity as a victim of crime um, and also in their capacity as a, an offender or an accused person. Um, we have heard a lot lately um, about, of course, in the media about domestic violence and also increasingly we're hearing about victimisation of women um, or, sorry, criminalisation of women who experience domestic violence. We've been seeing that for quite a long time, unfortunately. Not just women, but particularly young women, also young men um, and children um, who are um, victims of family violence and who en end up um, being the one um, facing, facing the courts as um, accused people. Um, importantly, we also provide social work support or casework support um, and referrals to other services where we can't help. So next slide, please. Okay, another part of our role, important part of our role is legal education. Um, the two people in this photo, I should acknowledge, um, Sanaina Pinto and April Humphreys, also known as April MacDonald. They were two of our case workers um, a few years ago. They've both moved on. We were fortunate um, for a very brief period to have two casework positions. Um, we're now back down to one. But if any of you good people <laughs> has, has, has a, a, a bit of cash lying around and you would like to consider um, contributing to um, another casework position, of course, um, that's very much, very much needed. Um, so April and Sanina there are um, standing in front of a rack of um, brochures about different services and about different legal issues. Um, we ourselves have um, legal fact sheets which are available on our website. Um, a lot of people in the youth sector have given us feedback and said they're a great resource. Um, at the moment, we're really struggling to keep them all um, up to date, but we're really trying um, because they are a really useful resource for the youth sector. Um, next slide, please. Also, another thing we do um, or we participate in is law reform. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the resources to have a full-time policy worker or a media officer or whatever. Um, we do our law reform work um, in our spare time, where, wherever we can find it. Um, two of us are both uh, are members of um, law society committees. I'm a member of the Law Society Criminal Law Committee. My colleague, Jane Irwin, is a member of their Children's Legal Issues Committee. Um, very often we sit on government uh, working groups um, and uh, and the like, we give submissions to parliamentary inquiries. Something that we are um, involved in at the moment, although as a fairly minor player, is um, the campaign to raise the age of criminal responsibility from 10 to 14. Um, that's something we'd really like to see happen. We are playing a very um, background role in that though. Something that we had more of a role, more of an extensive role in was um, in the development of the new um, mental health, um, oh, what's it called? Mental Health and Cognitive Impairment Forensic Provisions Act, which provides procedures for criminal courts to deal with people with mental health problems or cognitive impairments. Um, this new act has come into force um, just at the beginning of this year, around March this year, actually. Um, we were really quite heavily involved in helping to develop the um, new act, at least the part of it that applies to local and children's courts. Um, I know I haven't got a lot of time. I could go on and on and on about some of the law reform um, we've been involved in. A lot of it's really frustrating. A lot of it's not successful, um, but we have had some successes over the years. Um, one thing that springs to mind also is the way that um, people with unpaid fines are dealt with. 
there are now way, way more options um, for people to deal with their unpaid fines. Of course, we didn't achieve that single-handedly. That was part of a collaboration with a lot of other community legal centres, the legal aid sector and the community sector. Um, but it's really gratifying when years of work um, collaborating with, with other services and other um, peak bodies and the like, really gratifying when it actually does achieve something. And next slide. Okay, so our team, this photo was our team a couple of years ago, um, plus a few extra, a few of our volunteers. Um, the gentleman on the right, the far right, was the managing uh, partner of Herbert Smith Freehills um, at the time. Um, that was at a lunch, at the pro bono lunch that Herbert Smith Freehills hosted pre-COVID when we could all have events like that. Um, but the people in that photo largely are our staff and some of our volunteers. So at the moment, we've got four solicitors, two of us are full-time, two are part-time. One is a lawyer on a six-month secondment from Herbert Smith Freehills. We do have a law graduate who's just joined us as part of the Aboriginal Social Justice Graduate Program, which I mentioned earlier. Her name's Laura Russell. She'll be with us for 12 months um, and then she will go to PIAC for 12 months. Then we hope um, that we will be able to um, receive more funding to employ um, another graduate and keep the program going. Um, we've got two fantastic legal support and admin staff. Uh, we've got an amazing uh, caseworker who's actually not in this photo. I don't know where he was that day. Maybe he was on the phone to a client in crisis. I can't quite remember. And then we've got about at least 10, probably more volunteers um, who are mostly law students. Some of them are also social work students um, doing placements with us. Next um, slide, please. So the people in that photo are two of our former volunteers. Um, the one on the left, um, Sumaya, she's actually from the US. Occasionally we do have um, international students on placement. So she came and did a placement with us a few years ago. She's now an immigration lawyer in New York City. And Alicia, who's a little bit in shadow, um, she's now a family lawyer with uh, Legal Aid. Um, so it's great to still be in touch with some of our volleys and, and um, see where they've, where they've ended up. Um, our volunteers do amazing things. It's really challenging at the moment with COVID because everybody's working remotely. So we can't have our volleys in the office answering phones and doing filing and whatever. Um, but they are still helping us. A lot of them are working remotely. They're helping us with legal research and, um, and, and other tasks. We value them hugely. Um, we love having them. Um, and again, as I said before, we really love staying in touch with them and seeing where they've, um, where they've ended up. And next slide, please. I think we're almost at the end, which is good. So this is a comment from a psychologist who has um, worked with the shop front over the years. Um, that's just one individual view, but without wanting to blow our trumpet too much, um, the feedback we get about the shop front um, and about its impact is often quite similar. So that's the end of the slides and um, enough talking from me. Um, I hope that there might be um, a few questions that I could address in the next few minutes. It's great, Jane. There were some questions, but as they were coming to me, I was crossing them off as you spoke to them. You were so thorough. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I do have a question here from Ciara from Mutual Trust, and she's asked, once clients have finished using your services, what does referral look like to other programs to address mm. the underlying issues for them? Yeah, that's a good point. I guess um, a lot of clients never quite finish using our services, um, but uh, often while we're working with clients, um, they are often um, already engaged with other um, other services, youth services, um, whether that's caseworkers, counsellors, um, psychological services, transitional accommodation. So often they come to us already um, with a network of services. Um, sometimes they don't. And while we're working with them, um, we are actively um, working to refer them to um, 
to services. So um, often the first, um, if, if they're not already engaged with um, with some support services, often the first person we call on would be our own in-house caseworker, James, um, and he will try to make some referrals. He might um, be the client's primary case manager for a period of time. And cool. Um there's a question that you sort of answered before. You mentioned that there was some legal uh, law reforms around mental health. Yeah. How is that playing out in what you're seeing as um, sentencing for young people and how's it being considered? Well, the reforms actually are not that... They're actually not that significant, to be honest. Um, and, and also the new act has only um, been enforced for about three months. So we're just seeing matters beginning to trickle through. So when it comes to the diversionary procedures that apply in local and children's courts, which we, we do a lot of, some of you will have heard probably about section 32 applications, which is a diversionary procedure um, in local or children's courts, instead of dealing with a criminal matter in the usual way, if a person's got a mental health issue or a cognitive impairment, if the court thinks it's more appropriate, um, they can dismiss the charges, usually on conditions that the um, person has to comply with a case plan. You know, if, they, if it's a mental illness, usually it means they need to have treatment and medication. If it's a cognitive impairment, obviously treatment is not, can't be treated, um, but usually they have a support plan. They have to engage with their case workers or NDIS plan or whatever. Um, so fundamentally that hasn't, changed a lot there actually was a plan I think or, or, or on the drawing board to actually make some changes that would have been a bit more significant but that would have required a lot of funding which um, the government unfortunately uh, either didn't have or wasn't um, you know wasn't willing to, to commit so um, yeah, the, the diversionary procedures now, all of the, it's a new act, lots of different sections. So a section 32 applications now, a section 14 application. Fundamentally though, um, the, the procedures are still pretty similar. Um, but I do think there is a growing acknowledgement um, and a growing understanding in the courts of the impact of um, mental illness. I think I can definitely, I, I can definitely say that. Um, and I think mental health issues and cognitive impairment, um, I mean, they've always been taken into account in sentencing, but I think maybe the courts are, are now getting a little bit more sophisticated in their understanding of it. Thank but there's you. still not enough services. I mean, the thing is with these diversionary programs, to be successful, it depends on the person actually having access to appropriate services. And we do so much work and, our, you know, other partner organisations and other, other youth organisations, so much work in trying to make sure that clients actually have appropriate access to, firstly, just assessments. We have so many clients who come to us as young adults. It seems pretty clear to us that they have a cognitive impairment, an intellectual disability or similar. And they've never been properly assessed. Or maybe they were assessed when there was... It's, at school and there's some report buried in their Department of Education records, which we end up obtaining, um, you know, by through through the um, GIPA, Government Information Public Access. Um, so having access to actual proper assessments and also proper support or treatment if, if you need it, um, it's really hard. And so that still operates as a barrier to people with mental health issues and cognitive impairments being properly dealt with in court. I have one last question. Um, Jane, in an ideal world, what else incrementally would the shopfront benefit from in providing this wonderful service? Um, if we could have a family lawyer, I think that would be great. Um, our current team are quite, you know, are quite de-skilled at, at family law and it can be quite difficult to run a family and a criminal practice at the same time because they operate on different timetables and things. Um, it, it, it can be quite hard. So if, if we could have even a part-time family law specialist, um, that would be fantastic. I think it would enhance the range of services that we could provide. Um, if we could have <laughs> anything, so many things. If we could have a, a more sort of senior um, or, or coordinating type um, admin person or, or coordinator, 
um, to take a bit of the management load um, off me, being really selfish, or um, to, to to perhaps help help share some of the role that I um, that I do. Um, if we could have another case caseworker or, or youth worker type role, sorry, the wish list is endless. Um, we're so thankful for what we've got, um, but they are a couple of things that um, I think would really could really make a difference. Well, thank you so much, Jane. Such a rich uh, overview of such an important service. It is so clear that your care comes from such a deep place, your journey into the shop front initially, and then the care that you've provided. Um, you lead such a small but incredibly effective team. And um, as you just mentioned then, with more, we can do more. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, couple of the keys challenges is that we do meet young people where they're at and where they are at is incredibly diverse with a whole set of problems and a whole set of challenges in terms of working through the bureaucracy of the legal system to try and find a pathway out of their, their challenges and so your team really does provide that support. I really want to thank all of those generous uh, donors that have been giving to the shop front. You can see the impact that it's having and, and how important it is. Uh, uh, but with more, we can do more. And so really appreciate your ongoing support and uh, your generosity to date. And thank you in advance for how you may be able to continue uh, to support us. I did talk about the youth survey earlier. Um, if you want to share that and let people know about it, it's open this year for 2021 until the 9th uh, of August. Uh, and you can find that on our website, missionaustralia.com.au. And you can put a slash and it's youth survey that can take you there. Jane, thank you once again. Uh, really appreciate the overview. I'm sure those people that are on the line have appreciated it as well. Uh, and um, thank you all for you that joined and for your generosity and support uh, to date. Have a wonderful afternoon. See you later. Thanks, everyone.